Um, without further ado, our first speaker is Dame Mary Cray. She's the CEO of Living Streets, which is a campaign for better pedestrian provision. Um, she has, I understand, been in post uh, only for a couple of months. Um, and she's going to talk to us about Living Streets' new vocal stance and how we can make more impact as, uh, as campaigners. So over to you, Mary. Thanks very much uh, indeed, Nick, and um, great to listen to Claire there, and thanks for the introduction. I've just done my own um, sort of mad dash uh, back from the office uh, to join you from my bedroom and uh, sort of sprang up the stairs and uh, have got a sort of, I've got my dinner sitting at my elbow. So apologies if I... Um, turn the camera off uh, when I've done my piece because I'll be I'll be eating some some food but also I will stay and and listen to what everyone is saying. Um, I thought I would try and share with you um, if I can oh I'm not sure actually share screen here we go um, maybe I won't let me just get my powerpoints up because um, or I, could, I what I'll do I think is just talk about what observations from the first four months, my reflections on COVID and how we build back better and perhaps say a little bit about the uh, climate change report that came out to today as well. So first of all, um, every organisation is now a COVID effective organisation and um, Living Streets is no different to that. Uh, we've all seen just how quickly the our country, our cities and the world can move in order to respond to a um, global emergency. And with the vaccinations uh, taking place, um, which kicked off yesterday in my hometown of Coventry, um, we now see a sort of faint glimmer of light at the end of, of, of the tunnel. And that's amazing to see. Um, the government talks about building back better. And we are hosting the COP26 Climate Summit next year uh, in Glasgow. And I think this is a really amazing moment for um, the active travel movement, for, for walkers, for cyclists to say, actually, you can move really quickly. We've been talking about this for 30 years and we've seen what you can do. Um, and we want to bake in some of those improvements, some of those uh, safety improvements, some of that road space reallocation. Now, COVID hasn't affected everybody equally. Um, what it has done is exacerbate and reveal um, already existing inequalities, which is why it was so interesting to hear Claire talk about um, your crowdfunding for the tricycles and the inclusive agenda. And um, what I, I think is important is that as, as an organisation, Living Streets' new strategy is about speaking up. Um, so it's about um, being unafraid to talk to governments, to demand of politicians better streets, safer streets, um, to scale up what we do. Um, we work very, very effectively. We have uh, projects in Manchester. We have school projects in Manchester and across the northwest. Um, but we're not present everywhere and we're not present in every city. We have a network of local groups not present in every city. So we want to scale up, to speak up and to really make sure that we stay strong as we go forward over the next five years. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very uh, pleased to be partnering uh, with organisations like yourself in amplifying our voice on these issues. Now, what have we learned about? First of all, there is a, there is a lot of uh, funding that has been allocated to walking and cycling. And the budget has basically said it's it's two. I think it's two hundred and fifty seven million pounds, and um, we advocated for a revenue capital split. That, you know, a greater spend on revenue rather than capital. So the government likes to do an eighty twenty split capital revenue. There's no point building cycleways if you don't give people the confidence and the skills to be able to use them. There's no point, um, you know, building um, safer streets and putting in school streets. If, if the old behaviours carry on. So you need to put that behaviour change piece in. And that's what we've got um, years and years of experience of doing. And what's really encouraging, I think, is to see the growth, the explosion of school streets um, across the country and parents who are concerned about the air pollution um, consequences, the noise, the stress, the arguments. I know from standing at school gates for many years, 
um, they weren't always the most tranquil of places. I often saw the odd bit of argy bargy at school gates uh, between parents parking illegally on the lines, leaving their um, vehicles to idle. You know, every child should have the right to go to school safely. Every um, person should be able to walk on their streets and that includes people with dementia, that includes older people, those voices of those people being vaccinated yesterday, they have the right to be out and about, heard in the world and to exist in, in and to socialise safely and we need to think about what decent streets look like for them. Um, you know, they need benches, they need to be dog poo free, but we've got to go beyond the dog poo uh, argument um, and the leaves argument. Uh, we've got to make them um, safe for, for boys uh, to go home from school without living in fear of knife crime. So there's an, a massive agenda here. And, um, and I think as we uh, look forward, um, there has been a lot achieved through the emergency active travel fund that the government put out, the emergency allocations of funding. We've seen a lot of pop-up cycle lanes, a lot of pop-up um, pavements. Are all of them perfect? No, they're not. Um, but what research has shown is that they are popular. Generally, two thirds of people support those schemes. Um, and there's a lot of mythologies that have grown up around uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. I think it's a slightly unfortunate turn of phrase. I think maybe we need to brand them as people friendly streets as they have in Hackney or child friendly streets because um, or grand grandparent friendly streets as well. So these are, you know, streets where people can walk and cycle and can meet. Uh, safely um, and ideally where there's a 20 mile an hour speeding um, speed uh, imposed there as well. So we want to be able to um, make sure that those school streets are rolled out, that those low traffic neighbourhoods are rolled out. But obviously what I think is unfortunate is that some of those um, neighbourhoods and some of those plans have attracted controversy and I always get a bit worried when I see Nigel Farage saying he's going to be uh, standing councillors um, at the um, at the next uh, council elections from his whatever party it is that he's now in in charge of. Um, I'm sure Nigel Farage is going to be in charge of a political party for as long as he, for someone who hates politicians, he, he certainly seems to love politics, but also the sort of divisive politics which amplifies people's divisions. And I would hope that after the shared experience that we've all been through with Covid, part of the building back better would be about listening and speaking to each other in a more neighbourly, um, conciliatory and, and friendly way. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to, to have those conversations in a considered and considerate way. We have produced, along with the walking and cycling um, Alliance, a sort of a, a, a myth myth busting document, which I'll post in the chat afterwards, which just gives well, we sent it out through the local government association to give councillors and we've sent it to MPs some comfort about what it is that they're doing. I remember as a young councillor, well, I still feel quite young, but probably uh, not for many of you, um, but um, sitting in a school hall introducing the first controlled parking zone in Islington back in 1999 and it was the end of the world as we knew it to be able to um, propose a scheme around the tube stations where people were going to have to pay £35 a year to park outside their own home um, and yet as soon as, as it was introduced the, the, the commuter parking disappeared it tended to go into the next door area, the next door streets who then immediately demanded a control parking zone and we ended up um, reallocating that road space um, back to the residents and their vehicles but what we have seen is a huge growth with sat, sat navs Google Maps, uh, Waze, etc., of vehicles using our back streets as rat runs. And I think that is deeply, deeply unfortunate. And we know in our cities, this is contributing to um, the twin epidemics that we have of um, air pollution, um, but we also have an epidemic of, of obesity. And if we're going to tackle those epidemics, we need to start by getting people out of their cars for those short local journeys. There's a lot of controversy in London at the moment around Ealing, but one in 10 journeys in Ealing is under a kilometre. And 
that's you know it's ridiculous and uh, for people to take their cars on such short trips so what the low traffic neighborhoods people friendly streets do is create the space which says actually by the time you've sat at uh, gone round the long way to, to do this and and the rat runs are closed it, it's actually quicker for you to walk or cycle and as someone who took um rat well walked cycle and ran up the hill with my two children for the last 13 years um, I would often cycle, they would run, I and mean, I always say to them, that's why they're so fit, because we were often late. Um, this is this is how you keep kids fit. This is how you get them talking. This is how you um, meet up with your friends, give kids a bit of independence. And I think all of those things are undervalued. In my day, 75% of kids walk to school. Now it's under 50%. So I think we've got a real task to get our kids walking, to get our parents walking, and to make sure that that we talk about the benefits for every pound invested in a walking scheme that we run we deliver five pounds in benefits in terms of uh, child activity congestion reduction because one in four cars in the morning peak rush hour is on the school run we've got to convert that into the school walk and we've got to um, get people walking and I just want to close um, by saying a couple of other uh, final thoughts First of all, more cars equals fewer friends. And that's a really profound statement when you think that the number of cars on our road has, has um, I think, more than trebled over the last uh, 30 years since 1970. So the more cars that there are, the less likely people are to know their neighbours. And this is research that came out of California, but has also been replicated in Bristol in our own country. Uh, and if you think about those high traffic neighbourhoods, um, you can they tend to be more atomised. People tend to not know their neighbours. So there's something really interesting about so the social life of neighbourhoods and what happens um, when cars are restricted. Not everyone can still get to their cars and can still drive them for the journeys that they want to drive them. And will still, you know, in some cases, um, will need them for longer journeys, etc. But in terms of um, more cars equals fewer friends, I think that's something that's that's quite profound as we look at the epidemic of loneliness and mental health issues that we've seen um, bubbling up through the COVID isolation. And it's not just the mental health of older people, it's the mental health of younger people. So that's my first point. And the second point is the Committee on Climate Change report on how we get to net zero, how we get that 80% reduction in our baseline 1990 emissions by 2035 and um, the target of a 9% reduction in vehicle mileage but a, a, a third fewer car journeys so that shows you that um, there will still be car journeys but you can get rid of a third of those journeys and reduce the mileage by 10% so it shows just how many short journeys are, are happening. I think we've seen some return to the car as part of the um, messaging from ministers post-COVID, but we know that what will really change our streets is better access to buses, better access to trams, better access to trains. And for every um, bus journey, we know there are 17 minutes of walking, whereas we know with every car journey, there's one minute of walking and that's from the house to the um, to the garden gate or to the to the car door. And I think when you when you hear stats like one in five people across the country do less than 20 minutes continuous exercise walking a, a year, not a not a month, not a week, not a day, a year. We, we we it shows just how far we have to go in terms of getting the nation moving and i hope we can make um we can move beyond the current culture wars that we're having on this on these issues um that we can start listening to each other and working together and we at living streets will be um launching our manifestos for the mayoral and the county council elections in the new year and i hope we'll see many of you on our calls and uh joining our calls so that every councillor every candidate signs up to our ambitious vision of what our cities our towns and our neighborhoods can be i'll leave it there thank you great thanks mary so we've got a few questions um we haven't got an awful lot of time um if we're gonna keep to the timetable but um we've just put a couple of these questions to you uh, one from helen who has come in um we know that boris johnson is keen on walking and cycling so is andrew gilligan do you get um do you get a sense of whether the rest of the tory party will torpedo their plans uh, will Tories in marginal boroughs campaign against LTNs in the May elections next year? Um, I think it's a mixed picture. Um, I think 
I think generally politicians who live in cities of, of all descriptions, this is not a Labour, Tory, Green, Lib Dem thing. But I think if you if you if you tend to be in a city, you tend to have more um, um, empathy with those who are on foot and use public transport. And if you're in a in a sort of shire or a very small town or a county council, um, there's perhaps um, a view about looking out from your um, car windscreen I think there's that's a gross generalization and there are very many exceptions to that so I would say that um, this generation of conservative um, national politicians are pretty um, uh, you know well apprised of the of the of the green um, side of things I think where speaking as a former councillor and a former MP, where politicians tend to get a little bit nervous, A is around election time and B is around um, opposition and petitions and things like that. And I think we've seen schemes being pulled out in some areas and then the silent majority in favour of them saying, actually, we're not happy with that. No one consulted us. So there's an issue about, you know, who's making the noise? Is the noise genuine or is it actually some of these machine bots um, that are, that are protect, you know, that are also tweeting about Donald Trump, that are also anti-vax, that are also um, in some cases pro-Brexit? Or are these real people who are trying to have a conversation? And I think there's some some sort of cyber skills and cyber learning that we could have in that um, to, to sort of basically um, block, block and report some of those tweets. I, I came across one the other night and I was laughing because it, it, it done 225,000 tweets in the last three years. And by my calculation, that's about 300 um tweets a week and you know I did some maths and I was thinking that's hundreds of tweets a week you know nobody is doing that this is just you can scroll down and you can kind of work out um you know which ones are, are, are sort of put from the St Petersburg uh, troll farms so I'm I'm not sure and I think in a way it's up to us as campaigners to elevate our voices and to um, make sure that this big amount of funding, and this is, you know, a, a really interesting and big improvement in active travel funding that's been announced by the government. Let's not let's not forget that, um, with an ambition to spend two billion pounds um, over the next five years, I think it is, is is gen a genuine game changer if it's done right. Will they get to two billion pounds? I don't know, they're going to need to scale up very, very fast. Do the traffic engineers and the local authorities have the skills to deliver this? That's another question. Uh, are they confident in consultation? That's another question. Um, are we clear that, you know, not every traffic engineer who is trained in car flow management understands how pedestrians and cyclists move, understands safer crossing, understands safer speeds, um, understands health outcomes. Do the planners understand how to design? I had estates in Wakefield that didn't have footpaths. You know, how is that meant to work? You know, how can we design for walking and cycling if there's no paths? So there's all the, or, or, or the cycle paths are down a sort of dodgy dark alleyway that you wouldn't dream of going up late at night. So there's things like that where you it's the whole planning design it's not just about the traffic engineers it's about the vision of the city it's about what good neighborhoods look like and with the town centers and the difficulties we're seeing with shops also making the local economic argument that says you might only be able to have four customers inside the shop but you can have 20 customers seated safely outside your coffee shop and that keeps four people um in work over the next um, year while we all get vaccinated and there's there's some really interesting research that we We've done on the pedestrian pound. Um, I, I'm just con uh, conscious. Communities experience air and noise pollution more, especially boundary roads. How can these residents be included in design? That's a really great question, Emma. And I think that um, the the issue is that what happens generally in the introduction of schemes is that there is sometimes a small increase in traffic on those main roads but that traffic generally disappears over time as people make the switch to active travel over their um for their short journeys or they tend to go at quieter times or they tend to do instead of doing 
three or four trips in a day, they'll just do one trip. And so behaviours change um, when these um, projects happen. And um, and I would like to see, I mean, the air pollution bit, there's a big focus on electric vehicles, but they still produce particulate matter from tyres and brakes. And the heavier the car, the more air pollution they produce. So, and the more damage they do to the roads as well. So in, in a way, if we're going to look holistically at how we manage our roads and, up, and, and um, do road upkeep, you would look at um, lighter, smaller vehicles as well. Um, so I hope I've answered that. Great, Mary. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I'm afraid we're going to have to cut you off there from, um, from speaking just so we can stick to our timetable. Thank you very much for a really fascinating presentation and also taking the time over the questions. I don't know if you've got a few moments just to... Uh, scan through the chat maybe you could contribute in there um but yeah so um thank you very much and um we're going to move on now to our next speakers